So I think I'm, I think we're good. Uh, I'll make sure you're on the right. No. I have to Okay. Everyone, happy Wednesday, almost Friday. So somebody forgot notes and charger in the lab. No? Charger? Yours is charger? Then no. These are yours? Thank you. All right. Good. Uh, that is another item. Uh, one of one of the students in today's lab put their lunchbox, like everybody else, outside of the table. And the lunchbox was missing. If by any chance you took a lunchbox that probably you open it, you find a different lunch. <laughs> Not yours. And there are keys in there of a car and a home and a lab. These are more important than the food. So <laughs> If you find it, you've seen it, please at least return the keys, keep the lunch. <laughs> uh, one other thing, uh, a couple of other things. First of all, I have several of you that said will update their notebooks and give them to me. If you haven't done so, please do so by one by Friday so you can get a grade. If you have not gotten a grade for your lab notebook, please make sure you give me your lab notebook so that I can give you a grade on it. These grades are kind of gifts <laughs> to you. We just want you to learn how to record things in your lab notebook and just extra points that will help you out. So please do that. One other thing uh, I was asked to remind you guys by our TAs and by CAT, watching videos is very important. It's really you come to the lab and you are prepared to run the experiment. They expect you, the TAs expect you to know what they're doing. Not like, oh, here's the video I watched two minutes and I'm done. Please watch it. We spent a lot of time preparing these videos for you. Please watch it. It will save you time, save errors. For example, we had a major error in GC. One of the groups loaded water in the vial, the water layer instead of the solvent layer, and it messed up the entire set of data. So please, please, please watch these videos. It's for your own educational benefit. Trust me. Okay, so thank you all and Gary, it's all yours. <laughs> okay. Well, away we go again. So I talked about gas chromatography uh, in the last couple lectures, and it's, it's kind of fun then to lead into mass spectrometry because I said a little bit about mass spectrometry when we were talking about gas chromatography, just how important mass spectrometry is to, to that technique. And so one of the, the main uses of mass spectrometry is certainly to identify unknown compounds. And unless you know what something is, um, you don't know what it is. That, that may sound weird, but you can't assume something. You need doc documentation. It is what it is. And so mass spectrometry is really good for that. To elucidate the structure, chemical properties of molecules as well, we give some examples, and certainly to quantify known compounds. So those are the primary, primary uses. If we go through uh, applications, I just selected a few. How's that? We could go on for many pages of it. They become so broadly used, it's absolutely amazing. So these are some detect, identify, use of steroids in athletes. Monitor the breath of patients by anesthesiologists during surgery. Determine the composition of molecules found in space. Determine when honey is adulterated with corn syrup. Locate oil deposits by measuring petroleum precursors. If you could probably read that. <laughs> anyway, I don't necessarily have to read it to you. Monitor fermentation processes. Detect uh, dioxins, determine gene damage, elemental composition, semiconductors. See if horses are given cobra toxins to deaden the thing. If the list just goes on and on and on for the application of this technique. It, it is uh, interesting that mass spectrometry really started at the University of Minnesota in the chemistry department. It's uh, very well, well known for that. 
And so we're going to go through it kind of by parts or pieces and what each of those pieces do and end up giving you then some examples of, of application. We talk about the source and that's the source of energy. What we're going to do is we're going to take uh, molecules, we'll get them in there from GC, LC, from whatever, and we're going to hit them with energy. What's the source of that energy? We'll go through some, some examples. And basically what happens when you hit a molecule with a high amount of energy, it explodes. It blows into bits and pieces. It breaks at the weak fragments, the weak bonds, the strong bonds stay together. So there's a pattern of fragmentation based on molecular structure. Generate neutral, positive, negatively charged ions. Um, because of the way we analyze these ions, we like to work with charged ions and particularly positive ions. So most of our mass spectrometers are set up to separate out any possibly charged ions and work with them in detection. We then need some way to separate these fragments. So we got this ton of fragments. Okay, let's separate them one by one. So then we can go ahead and detect and count the fragments that we've got. And based on the fragments, the quantity and the type of fragment, we're able to compare by computer databases and basically get identification. So those are kind of the parts that we look at. This is uh, an example of a, a magnetic sector MS. I'm not gonna worry about this right now. What I wanna do is focus on the source over here. So whatever is coming in from a GC, LC, or just simply sucked in from the environment, sampling the air around us, they come into here, and we've got a way that this comes in here. Here's an electron beam. And so now we have an electron, well, 20 electron volts or higher electron volts. So these electrons come through, and any analyte goes through that beam. And that's where the beam hits the analytes and breaks them into fragments and pieces. We then kind of subtract them out and then boy, these are positive points and we will have a negative plate here. So we're gonna accelerate these bits and pieces, charge positive pieces in this direction. So that's basically our source. We have to have some way to do separation. And I'll go through different ways of separation. How do we take this massive uh, ions that we have here? and separate them and count them one by one. That's one technique to use a magnetic sector. I'll put a little more time in, in that a little bit later. So principle of uh, operation, pure compound ideally is introduced. And so hopefully you've gotten a pure compound because you can actually put it on a direct probe. You've got a little uh, entryway you can open up, put a compound there, push it in bombard it and do analysis. Or you can feed it by GC or you can feed it by HPLC. So those are certainly three techniques. And our electrons can be as low as 20 electron volts. They can be as high as 70 electron volts. Most of our bonds are somewhere around 10 electron volts. And so, like I say, when we put 70 volts in it, it literally explodes. It's too much energy, so it breaks bonds and preferentially breaks weak ones. And so our source, and so um, electron ionization, so that's our source of energy. If we bombard it with 70 electron volts, these, we get a lot of pieces. It blows into a lot of bits and pieces. So we got a lot of pieces that we can look at. Maybe we've got 10, 20, 30, 50 pieces. And then I've got a real complex pattern that I can go in and match up in a library. The advantage is really I got a lot of information to do my comparison to literature to get an identification. This advantage is you may not see the parent ion. Who's the parent ion? <laughs> well, that's the molecular weight. That's the whole compound that just got an electron knocked off it. So if we get a, a parent ion, that gives me the molecular weight of our compound. If I know the molecular weight of our compound, that's a big help in terms of identification but we may not see it because we put in so darn much energy. So high energy, good fragmentation, really helpful identification and so on, but we would like to see a parent ion and we don't always see that. If we go in with low energy, like the 20 electron volts instead of 70, we do generally see the molecular weight, but only fragments a little bit. 
And so the idea that it only fragments a little bit is we get higher concentrations of big pieces. If I got higher concentrations of big pieces, I don't have as many pieces, right? So that charge I put on is concentrated on certain fragments, some of the fragments. And so that makes it more sensitive. Instead of having lots of little ones to try and measure one at a time, I only have a few big ones that carry much more charge. And so I get more sensitivity. I see molecular weight, I get better sensitivity, but I don't have enough fragmentation sometimes to identify what that compound is. Terms, so I just kind of defined the parent ion for you. It's the positive ion of the unfragmented molecule. So whatever we put in there, if we put in butyric acid, okay, it's butyric acid with a positive charge on it. That's going to give me my molecular weight. The base ion is the most abundant ion, the most abundant fragment. And that's really helpful to us too. It's a, it's a key of which, you know, in your identification, what's the most abundant fragment. And the way we look at this, um, in most techniques, LC, GC, we get peaks and we tend to look at the area. What's the area here? What's the area here? What's here? And you do some kind of calculation that some of the area. So this peak is maybe 20% of the total or 10% of the total. So for gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, we work with that. But for mass spectrometry, we look at that most abundant ion and everything is proportioned, not to the total, but to that one big major ion. And so you'll look at these, you'll see them later. They aren't presented as you might expect if you're into gas chromatography or liquid chromatography. They're set up a little, little differently. And this is uh, an example here. This happens to be perichloroacetophenone. So that's the molecule here. So perichloroacetophenone, so we've got our molecule in between and our two benzene rings. So that's, that's the, the pure compound. Nothing's happened to it. Its molecular weight is 216. If I hit that with seven electron volts, these are the fragments I'm going to get. And 105, a piece that's a molecular weight of 105, this piece right here, is the most common fragment. That's the most abundant fragment when you blow it to pieces. And so that gets 100%. 77 down here, if we just get a benzene ring, we knock off that CO off there, then it has a mass of 77. So that's like 65% of that. So everything is based on the most abundant one. And so what do we have? I see a molecular weight. I see a fragment. Uh, where do we want to look? Well, we can do the 111. That's that fragment, that piece. This is the intact molecule. You can basically feed this into a computer database and it'll tell you, oh, hey, guess what? This perichloro set up the null. It'll rank it in terms of how good a fit it is. And so it'll give you anywhere from, I don't know if it ever was down to 0%. It, uh, <clears throat> it gives you best choices. It depends upon the software. They give you the 10 best choices and rank them. Here's, here's the computer's best guess, second best, and so on down, down the line. And so you don't get zeros, there's always something. So the computer always tells you how good the fit is. And the fit may be really good. That's a really easy molecule to identify, fairly unique pieces. You'd probably get 90%, 95% assured this, that the computer picked this compound, it's the right compound. But as you go down, of course, that's 80%, 70, it gives you other choices. There is you know, second choices and this good, third and so on. So it gives you a bunch of choices and it isn't always right. <laughs> and sometimes it's wrong. So you kind of look at that and you have to think about it. Is it reasonable? Is, is it right? So I'm always hesitant when somebody gets a mass spectrometer and they go to a printout. And actually it happened at the American Chemical Society a few years ago. I was uh, sitting in a, in a presentation and the person said, well, I've, he was identifying flavor compounds in pineapple. And so we normally put them in a list when we present them. And it's in the list of area evolution, first compound to elute off a gas paragraph, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and so on. So it's in order of, of evolution. So the table, and that's what you, you expect. 
And I'm kind of listening to him and he says, well, this is this compound, this first compound, the second one's this, third compound's that, fourth compound is butanol, fifth compound is such and such, sixth, seventh, eighth compound is butanol, ninth, so on down the line then. I'm sort of thinking, wait a minute now, normal butanol, how many, how many forms are there? One. <laughs> and so he simply took, it was wrong. At the end, I'm saying, ah, uh, how did you separate these? And how did you come up with two butanols that are normal butanol? I said, well, that's what the machine said. I said, that's not good enough. <laughs> it, really, it really isn't. You don't want to be in that case. You don't want to be the person that's standing in front of your boss or a group of other scientists and say uh, something that's completely wrong. So again, it goes back to read the book, read the manuals and become familiar with the, the technique. You know, I could have let it go and the whole room was filled and they did. And you think now, wait a minute, that's part of our obligation too. If something's wrong, you need to point it out. You do it politely, you do as best you can. Sometimes you talk to the person afterwards and say, well, oh, that really didn't go too well. What, what about this? But uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't let it go. So anyway, here we, we're going out, out, of, out of balance here. So let's keep on, let's keep on going. And so here's again, um, the difference between uh, high energy, 70 electron volts and and a low energy, so different ionization. Low energy, we see lots of our, our air compound out there, 127. We don't find any of our parent compounds at the lower mass. We find simply, well, mainly these two fragments when we get the high energy. But we get more information down here too. So we get these two, and we get a lot of information down through here. So we miss the mass but we get more ions, more fragments to do searching on. There are many different types. By far, this ion impact is, is really the, the number one workhorse. That's uh, really the only one we work with in our laboratory. Uh, but there's different, uh, there's different ways to, to use it. You know, right now, we go up to the mass spectrometry laboratory and we use MALDI a, a great deal. Matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. It has an advantage. I want to look at something that's 20,000 molecular weight. How do I get that through a gas photograph? You don't. You get it through an LC, perhaps. And so MALDI will take you into large molecules. And you'll, you'll see why in a moment. So you can get much larger molecular weight materials. Electro spray, that's really the choice for LC combinations. So for GC, we use what I was showing you before, electron uh, ionization. For this, we use electrospray. We'll, we'll touch on each of them. Then we have DESI, DART, and FAB. And I guess we'll go through each of these. So I won't spend more time with it now. So MALDI, high molecular weight analytes. Um, I'm looking at beta lactoglobulin, a dairy protein, a major whey protein. has a mass of 18,363. I would be in real trouble fine to see that, you know, by many other techniques. But MALDI works very nicely. So analysis of proteins, it's like say they'll throw actually close to 100,000 more. That's, that's amazing. So proteins, peptides, glycoproteins, disaccharides, oligosaccharides. My work, and I think I'll show you an example of that, is reacting flavor compounds or how flavor compounds react with protein to lose our flavor in foods over time. And that's going to be showing you taking aldehydes as flavor compounds, benzaldehydes, cherry. It's really not, but that's what you've been convinced is cherry. Okay, so benzaldehyde. It reacts with lysine side chain, and there goes your cherry flavor. It's once it's covalently bonded to the protein, you don't get the flavor anymore. So it's really, really interesting. The mold is useful for this. So how is this process run? Your sample is pre-mixed with a high energy absorbing matrix. So it's put in to a matrix and that matrix is a wonderful absorber of energy. You hit it with a, a laser and it transfers energy and just explodes. Excitation energy, sputtering of the analyte, matrix ion. So 
analyzed as ionized in the process with little uh, decomposition. You mainly get a molecular weight of the, the protein. And so the laser can be a pulse nitrogen laser. So that's what gets uh, the matrix that you've got your compound in. It literally explodes the ions that are measured, is not measured to see what you, you've got. So this is a kind of how it, how it goes. Got your, your sample in here, you hit it with the laser, you form ions, they get drawn out, so they can be positive ions. Negative uh, charge here, so they're drawn this way, you get a velocity, and they hit the detector. And we'll go through this region too and that region down on the end, what they are and how they work. It is a soft, what we call soft ionization. Um, what that means, soft ionization is kind of the same as low energy, but it's a soft ionization. So little fragmentation. Like I say, we mainly see um, molecular weight. A disadvantage is I only put one electron each molecule I want to analyze. It only picks up one charge. And if I've got one charge on a large molecule, it's pretty hard to get that flying through the air to be measuring uh, on the, the other part of the MS. So it is limited in molecular weight. And we'll see a little bit later about another type of mass spectrometry that may pay five, 10, 20 charges on each molecule. And then you can get some larger, much larger molecular weight materials to, to analyze. So this would be an example of a protein. Here's our matrix. When we zap it with the laser, yep, we see 100 masses, 179, 270, 190, I'm sorry, 279. So that's the matrix that we ionize in the process. And here's our protein down here. So this is a fairly small protein. It's only about 20. 2400, 2500 mass units. So nice, nice technique. I love the sample preparation. You mix it <laughs> and it's done. You don't have to go through any convolution of gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or anything else. Just mix it with your analyte and that's your sample prep. My, my favorite. This, this is somehow related to that. It's a little different methodology, but it looks really the same. Fast atom bombardment. So instead of zapping it, that matrix with um, an ion beam, we actually bombard it with a molecule. So we're just having a different energy source, the way we deliver energy. Either it's delivered as a laser or it's delivered as a particle of high energy, high acceleration. The matrix, so what you mix your, your compound in, Glycerol or three nitrobenzyl alcohol. The beam can be a, a neutral gas, actually argon or xeon. So now we're going to take argon and xeon, we're going to charge them and give them a real high energy. So again, that's what it explodes our matrix and charges our, our ions. So the particle beam uh, transfers that energy from the matrix, analytes ejected off the surface, positive negative ions. And again, those ions are extracted out and they end up being measured. This is an example of it. So this could be argon, for example, high energy argon. Here's our matrix that we have our analyte in. It's kind of like a bomb in a sense. It just has so much velocity, so much energy. It explodes, breaks our molecule in pieces or gives us a charge on it. And so we have positive negative charge. We're going to have a negative charge up here, so we draw just the positive out. We focus that beam, and then we have to measure that beam, what's, what's in the beam. And so the measurement comes up a, a little bit later. Desi is one of my favorite. I like simple things. The simpler it is, the, 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 the better I like it. How, how's that? And so this one is where you take an, an inert gas here, and you Put that with a, a high energy coming down this direction. You lay your sample out here. It's kind of right out here. It's an atmospheric pressure. It's not under a, a high energy or you know high vacuum anything. It can just be slipping under, get it, and fragments, ions will break off. They get sucked 
my charge and velocity angle into the inlet of the master cover. So this is drawing in this fragment. So this is done outside the machine. So how's that for simplicity? There's my apple. I'm still looking for this treatment to, for apple scald, right? On the surface of the apple. I talked about tipping the apple in, in solvents and you know, concentrating the solvent, running in gas chromatography. How about if I just take that apple? That's a tomato. <laughs> okay. Tomato or apple, but I think it's you know, I, I agree with you. No, okay. So, what's easier than taking tomato, you know, holding it up here, hitting it for two seconds, and you're done? You just blasted that surface, and the ions that come off get drawn in here for analysis. Is that easy? You bet. DART is equivalent in a sense. Uh, this one uses a solvent. So it's typically a, a liquid, actually, solvent coming down that picks up the energy. DART is a dry interface. So in this case, we've got our sample here. It gets hit. Oh, okay, that's an, that's an example. So it's the same type of thing. You can put your sample in between. It gets hit with high energy and it bounces off, the ice bounces off and gets measured again. So there's just a difference in the way that it's what, what's actually used to ionize it, to energize it. So this is a dry system. Have you ever gone through the airport and they take a swab of anything? Swab, mass spectrometer, swab, mass spectrometer, looking for right, explosions, drugs, whatever, whatever they're looking for. The idea of DART, the ability to detect low parts per million of explosives in a muddy pond. Okay, not sure how we do with explosives in a muddy pond, but this was an example of one of the applications of it. Just simply put the, drop, the drops of water in a glass rod, place the rod up to the interface, and you've got your, your sample preparation, your analysis done in one shot. Do I like mass spectrometry? <laughs> you better believe I do. So, it's a method um, both DART and DESI can pick up many charges from molecules. And that makes it a little more complicated. If you see a mass here and a mass there, is it just there was two electrons? And so it's really the same compound. It's one mode electron, two electrons. They're going to give you two peaks, but are they the same thing? And so there's a little bit of problem in interpretation of the data, more so than the other techniques. But quite high mass range, which is really, really nice. Mass up to 20,000 AMU. Most of my work is done at masses less than 250. So I don't need this unless I'm looking at proteins, but it's a nice technique. It's a rapid technique. It's certainly simple. So those are the ways we kind of make ions. So we got to several different ways to ionize an analyte so we can measure it. Our next step is to say, okay, I just blew this thing into bits. Now I wanna know, I wanna separate, separate those bits, those masses, those fragments, so I can count them. What's my proportion of each of these fragments and bits? And so different types of mass analyzers, magnetic sector, that was in the picture of the first one a quadrupole, an ion trap, a time of flight, and say, what, what's next? <laughs> so that's looking, looking ahead. I, I love it. Anyway, so here we have our, our magnetic sector instrument. Here's where we get our ions being formed. So again, that first slide, we bombard our sample, we get ions, we draw them out, so they've got a velocity in this direction. They're all coming together. These massive ions that form at the same time. So we've got this field of ions, different weights coming out of this system. It goes through a magnet. And there's some place a right hand thumb rule that an electric charge moving through a magnetic field exists, exerts a force in yeah, this left hand, right hand, <laughs> in, in this direction. So what you do is you change the electromagnetic field. And you change this field so the low masses are focused down here. You a little more uh, magnetic field. Now, the next higher mass, next higher mass, you, you change the magnetic field to focus one molecular weight fragment at a time down to the detector so it's detected. 
that was our first mass spectrometer form that, that, that we had was this type of uh, selector. It's good, it works really well, but there's certain disadvantages to it that uh, other methods have, have taken over and become much more important. One of the problems is that that big bang is up there. That sucker takes a while to energize. It doesn't go from zero to a real strong magnetic field instantly. And I may want it. I may want really rapid counting, rapid analysis. On some of our GC analysis, I want that machine to sample my effluent 100 times a second. I want it to count every ion, what ions are there, and how much of those ions are there. And we can't do that with a magnetic sector. And so it was a workhorse. That's what I did my doctorate on, just using magnetic sector instrument. I was responsible for keeping it running. Time of flight has it really become a workhorse. In our lab, <clears throat> we have one time of flight. And the others are all quadruple, which we'll see in, in a moment. And so we basically have a, a situation where our sample is coming in here from a GC or from an F, from an LC, whatever, hit it with a, a laser, so we, we energize it. And then what we do is there, there's a certain electrical potential that will give ions a velocity. So it's boom, here's my collection. These are drawn out, all given the same kinetic energy. And then basically this machine times, how long does it take for an ion to get here, to get here, to get measured? If it's a big ion, remember probably someplace about kinetic energy, well, kinetic energy is about half mv squared. So the square of velocity tells you basically how long it's gonna to take to get across here. So, it's a technique that, like I say, I think about 100 times a second, I can't do with other instruments. So it's really useful in terms of following peaks along. Maybe I got one peak, right? As I showed you the last time, well, maybe there's two peaks and they differ by 10th of a second, 100th of a second. That measures it. Said, hey, there's peaks, different rates coming out of here. These are two compounds. This machine does that. It counts so quickly that it does that for you. So it's a, a nice technique. Quadrupole, that was what basically replaced our big magnets and magnetic sector. And it's been a workhorse. And we've seen the three or four of them down in the lab that are based on this technique. And as far as I'm concerned, my ability to explain it, I'll just give it up as magic. How's, how's that? And, and if you figure it out, then maybe you could explain to me one day. But I know what it needs to do. What it needs to do is it needs to take those ions. So again, you zap it, you get all these ions, you get them a, a velocity, and then they have to negotiate their way down through these electrically charged rods. And by varying the electrical potential on these rods, we can focus certain masses to make their way down to the detector. Some ions will not get too much uh, being bent, too much, getting too much energy, and they'll just be gone. So maybe they go this way or they go the other way. But anyway, by managing the electrical charge on these rods, you focus mass 50 and you measure mass 51 comes, you measure 52 comes. So you just keep on changing those rods to change the path of these ions as they go through the detector. Ion trap, I kind of treat this as magic also. And this is a, I know what the, how the, what the outcome is, and that's probably what's important, but I don't necessarily know how the heck they manage that. And an ion trap is literally that. It traps ions at a certain mass. So you can go ahead and bombard your molecule, you make it into bits and pieces. Those pieces come down, a, basically out of the ion source. And there's a place that you can trap ions of certain mass. By controlling electrical charge on these rings, I can keep certain masses in here. Now, on the other techniques, if you do it, it gets there, it's done. In this, you do it, it comes here, I can take more time, more time, build it up, build it up, build it up. Then I can release it and measure the ions, which means I have great sensitivity. I don't have to take just what happens to fly down, what time I have. I can collect certain ions. 
And so that really gives me an advantage of sensitivity. I can store up and then measure, store up and measure, instead of taking what's flying down the pathway. So those are the ways we separate ions. So, okay, I was thinking, I'm sure that's all you we were looking for today is learning about uh, how ions go through mass spectrometry. Well, I was smiling at them. Okay, this is interesting to me, but um, you guys may not feel that way at the moment. Okay, so we get ions that come down our sorting mechanism and we've got to count them somehow. We've got to measure them somehow. So I know how much of mass 43, how much it has mass 44, 45, and so on down the line. I need some way to count them, to measure. And that works basically uh, with an ion detector system. And so here comes our ion. So this is you know, mass 50 that's coming out of our magnetic sector or quadrupole, whatever. So here this ion comes out. It hits a, a series of plates. And these plates have an electrical charge. It hits this plate. and it, doubles it, doubles the ion count. It's this one, these dynodes, and triples perhaps the ion count and so on. So every one of these steps, it at least doubles some multiple of the ions that reach over here. It's like you get uh, this analyte that gets there and you, you, you get multiplied by 100 or by 1,000, the signal that you get. There's no other technique that works like this. And so you get tremendous sensitivity out of these things because we're working with ions that we can, we can multiply. So it, it offers you sensitivity, it offers you selectivity. It's really a, a fascinating technique. How to use MS identifications? Well, I think you've got a pretty good idea of that already. And since I showed you a compound, a chlorinated compound, and how you get fragments and you compare the fragments to a library. This happens to be an acetone, very simple organic solvent. You run it through your mass spectrometer. What do you get? You basically get a mass of 15. So that's one common fragment you get. There's another mass here, 27, another mass of 43 and 58. 58 is the molecular weight of acetone. If it loses a methyl group, we have a mass of 43. So that loses a mass or from CO2 or CO, oh, I'm sorry, we're down to 15. So basically, this is the pattern that we get. And that pattern is uh, looked up, like I say, in a, in a computer and searched in that way. And I think I've warned you enough about the idea of accepting what it tells you. <laughs> you need to little, use a little common sense, a little thinking about it. And like I say, if you're running a sample and you get butanol, it's identified three times in a row, you might say, okay, machine. You're kind of screwing me up here. And so you like to say, you need some common sense and some knowledge of what you're doing. The, most of our instruments are what we call low resolution instruments. I separate those fragments by mass, unit mass. On the previous slide, what did we have? We had mass, we didn't, we didn't list it particularly. Well, we got a mass of 58, a mass of 43, a mass of 15, a mass of 27. But you know that's not the mass. That's not the accurate mass. Uh, the only thing that has a, a unit mass is carbon, right? Carbon's 12. Nitrogen is not 15. It's something else, something greater. So the masses are never unit masses except for carbon. And so what we can do is we can really have a good mass separator. That doesn't separate them into oh, here's mass 43, here's mass 44. No, it's 43.1175. So I, maybe I can go ahead and say I can get the three decimal places. If I can get this instead of just being rounded off to 28, if I get it to 27.995, I know it can only be carbon plus an oxygen. That's the only combination that gives me a mass equal to this. So this is what we basically talk about as high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, I can do elemental formulas. So I run a compound, I can tell you how much carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It doesn't necessarily tell you how it's put together, but that's really a good starting point in knowing exactly what elements or atoms that you have in the system. And so that's just a, an example there. 
carbon monoxide, again, CO, the mass as listed. Computer assisting, yeah, uh, searching, you know, use care, absolutely. Uh, I think I've, I've probably made that point long enough. Interfacing a mass spectrometer with chromatographic methods. Everything we've mentioned so far, there was really no sample preparation. We kind of said, hey, we put this into the mass spectrometer, guess what we get? Okay. It's not always that simple. We can put a pure compound or an unknown into our mass spectrometer, but more than likely, we're going to use something else to do a separation and we're going to feed it to the mass spectrometer. So it'd be a gas chromatographic run. We take all those fatty acids you get and you'd simply connect to mass spectrometer at the end of it. And of course, as the fatty acids are looped from the GC column, they go to the mass spectrometer one by one. So it's really common, by far most common, to use either gas chromatography or mass spectrometry to do a separation. And so we then allow compounds to enter the system one, one by one. The major problem we have in interfacing a mass spectrometer with gas chromatography or liquid chromatography is maintaining the vacuum in the system. Normally, if, uh, what I've been talking about so far, we kind of have a closed system. You put some good pumps on that system, you get made of 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus sixth, millimeters of mercury, a, a tremendous vacuum, wonderful. The system works really well. If we don't have a good vacuum, the air basically neutralizes your, your ions and they're gone. You don't get any data without it being under a high vacuum system. You got to keep collisions from, from happening. And so how do we maintain the vacuum when I've got this GCF load? I'm putting in a ton of carrier gas into the system. If I'm running liquid chromatography, I'm putting a solvent in there. But all of a sudden it hits this vacuum, destroys my vacuum in my, in my system. And so we really have to have had to work with how we feed our compounds from an analytical instrument into a mass spectrometer. Life has gotten easier in that way for gas chromatography. Um, at one time, a gas chromatograph had a column that was a quarter inch in diameter. So a quarter inch diameter, the flow rate might be 30, 40 mils per minute through that column. I'd have to, what did I do with it? I have to dump that into the mass spectrometer to get my compounds into the mass spectrometer. And we simply couldn't, we couldn't live, we couldn't survive that much gas going into the system, 30, 40 mils per minute. So there were all kinds of ways that people worked. So we could interface this with this. As uh, gas chromatography has evolved, what do we have? We got smaller and smaller columns. They're no longer quarter inch. They may be you know, 0.2 millimeters. <laughs> okay. Now I have a tiny amount of gas. My gas chromatograph may be putting one mil per minute instead of 30 mils per minute into the system as they come out of the column. And so that's made it much, much easier. Um, well, there's a, a calculation up there. If I put one mil per minute into the mass spectrometer, that one mil of gas expands under a vacuum to 10 to the sixth mils of volume I got to pump out. That's an awful lot of change in volume. So if I want to maintain my vacuum, by feeding one mil in, I got to retain, take out uh, 10 to the six mils per minute. So think if I'm doing 30 mils per minute or 40 mils per minute, okay, I got a ton. What that means is we still need good vacuum pumps. All of our systems down there run with a, a roughing pump, a four pump. And then it has some kind of a turbo pump or a molecular diffusion pump. So there's something rough that kind of roughs it and let's take it down to a certain level. And then a high specialty, high vacuum pumps take over the job for you. But that pumping capacity is really an important one. So this is basically what you see if you go down in the lab. Of course, that's a capillary column, not a, it's really tiny in comparison to that. Capillary column feeds into the mass spectrometer. There's no problem now with interfacing. We used to like to say, no problem. We had big columns. We had to get rid of all that gas to pump. It goes directly into the system. You've got a quadrant pole here. So you bombard it. You do your separation here. You do the detection there. 
and so it simplified a great deal. So when we started doing gas chromatography, capillary gas chromatography, we improved our gas chromatography by a ton, the separation ability and so on, and really made it much easier to interface a mass spectrometer with it. And this is what I showed you before. So I, I hope I spent enough, enough time with that. So I, I won't spend any more time with it now. The idea in Abel is sample quickly to look at ions as they move through the system. It really makes identification easier. Well, we could quit early. We could do that kind of, yeah, your, your, your instructor said we should quit early. <laughs> I don't, this is, a, this is a longer subject. I don't want to get started with it and then have a minute to do it. So, okay, have a good day. I tried to steal it. I was going to steal it. You knew I was. Oh, you're going to steal it. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So that would be an easy steal. Okay, good.